Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself while we're waiting, um, since, uh, since this is not really pertinent information. Uh, you, it's okay to start early and let people wander in. Uh, my name's Jim Wyrick. I'm with Edge Case. I am the chief scientist at Edge Case. Now, you may be aware that Edge Case was just purchased uh, this year by Digital Garage, forming a new company called New Context, and Edge Case is one of the companies in the New Context uh, grouping of companies. And my, my new boss, my, my, the boss of my boss, is here at the Rails Conference, and I got to talk to him, and we're discussing titles. And I said, do I get a new title under the new regime? And he says, oh yes, what would you like? And I decided that rather than chief scientist, I would like to go with chief mad scientist. <laughs> And he felt that was too much of a bump up. <laughs> so we're deciding to go with co-mad scientists. I have to share the position with someone else, but the position hasn't been filled yet, so I'm doing both jobs right now. <laughs> so I was Edge Case. Um, I'm here to talk about rate. We called this basic rate when I uh, submitted a proposal. But uh, I realize that I've got so much information to give you, it's more like a boot camp type thing. So rather than basic training, go to the whole basic training boot camp thing. And I want to just tell you a little bit about rake. And the reason I want to do this is that I've been looking at a lot of rake files that people have been doing, and I, gosh, they're just using rake entirely wrong. You know, it's the whole, you're doing it wrong thing. So I'm out here to correct all that. Uh, how many people here, well, you're Rails developers, right? So you use Rake at all a little bit, maybe somewhat. Yeah, Rake DB migrate might be the extent of what you do with it. Okay, yeah. I'm here to tell you how to take advantage of Rake and use it. So we're going to get into just some of the really basic stuff about Rake and how it works and, and how you can use Rake to improve your life. So Rake is a tool for organizing tasks. Tasks are things that you need to have done. So we're going to start with kind of an overall, um, well, kind of an important task, right? So, I'm hungry. Let's make some mac and cheese, okay? So what do I have to do to make myself some, some macaroni and cheese? Well, first, uh, I've got to have uh, some, some pasta available. I have to have uh, some cheese available, and I gotta boil the water to make it. So these are some of the subtasks that might be involved in, in putting together a mac and cheese meal. Now there are dependencies here. In order to make mac and cheese, that depends upon all these other tasks. And this is the essence of rake, is to take a task and break it down to its component pieces and then specify what needs to be done in order to do the bigger task that you're trying to uh, involved. So, so if you took this and wrote it out as a rake, uh, rake file, it would look exactly like this. It would specify, I have my main task here, mac and cheese, and every task gets a title. And, and this is just Ruby code. Right? It's in a rake file, it's not in a .rb file, but it is just Ruby code. So anything you can do in Ruby, you can do in a rake file. So our task names happen to be symbols, they could also be strings, rake doesn't care. And uh, so every task has a name. Every task has an action. That action is encoded with a do end block that gets executed to perform that task. And then finally, tasks have dependencies. And we specify dependencies with this strange kind of arrow syntax. You say, oh, that looks really weird. But if you think about it, that's just hash syntax. Where Ray kind of uses a syntax quirk of Ruby in that if you give it a hash, that's just an argument that gets passed into the task method. And so we pull that apart, we take the key as the, as the task name, and the list as the value in the hash pair in there, that's just the list of dependencies. So it's just a, a syntax trick that Rake uses. Um, so you just list off the things that you want to have done. Before I can make mac and cheese, I must boil the water, buy the cheese, and buy, buy the pasta. All those three things must be done. So the command line, we say rake mac and cheese, and that is the name of that very first task right there. Rake mac and cheese, and we see coming out of the screen, boiling water, buying pasta, buying cheese, and then making the mac and cheese. Anybody see a problem with this? Order. I, you know what, I started by water boiling, and then I run out to the store. <laughs> And I buy my, my cheese and my pasta, then I come back. Actually, that might work pretty good because it's probably boiling by then. Might have boiled over, so that's probably a problem. I probably don't want to start the boiling water first. So if we look at our dependencies, what we see is that we've missed 
some dependencies. And what we really want to say is that before I boil the water, I want to make sure I have on hand both the cheese and the pasta, all the ingredients that go into making that. So I want to specify these dependencies as well. So I need to go back into my rake file and add these dependencies to the boiling water. Now once I've done that, I've not changed anything else here in this rake file, but once I've done that, I get magically buying the pasta, buying the cheese, boiling the water, and making the mac and cheese. So I forget all my dependency right, dependencies right, where it just automatically does the right thing. I realized I never started my timer. I have this really cool timer on my phone that tells me how long I've got to talk. And so now you guys, are, I'm going to go over because of this. Because <laughs> my timer says i got an extra five minutes now. Um, making, past, making mac and cheese. Okay, so getting the dependencies right is important in rake. So, tip, declare all the dependencies. If something must be done before any other task, make that an explicit dependency and just declare it. And then rake will magically make sure things get done in the right order. Now, I do want to point out that each of these things are individual tasks, and though I say rake mac and cheese, I could have very well have said rake buy cheese, and it would have done just that task. So you can invoke individual tasks, or you can invoke the big task that depends upon everything and have everything done. Either way will work. Okay, so now that I think about it, I, I realize that I probably broke this down a little bit incorrectly. Maybe I should have another task in there called go to the store. Because in order to buy the cheese and buy the pasta, I actually have to go somewhere. And maybe I need to have some work done that's common to both buying cheese and buying pasta. So let's add that as another task. And now there's dependencies between buying cheese and buying pasta. I have to go to the store first, so I'm there where I can buy the cheese. Now uh, we run this. Oh, well, here's, here's the rake task. So we add go to the store here, so here's a new task down here in our list. And then we also add two dependencies to cheese and pasta so that it uh, depends upon going to the store. So going to the store will be done first before either of these tasks are run. So when I run it, I magically get the right thing. Going to the store, buying the pasta, buying the cheese, boiling the water, and making the mac and cheese. But think about that. Didn't I have, I have two dependencies on going to the store. Why didn't I go to the store twice? Let's work through how rake handles dependencies. So I specify mac and cheese as my first dependency. So Rake looks at that task and says, oh look, I want to make mac and cheese. And I see there are three dependencies on mac and cheese. I must satisfy all the dependencies first before I can make the mac and cheese. So it goes off and starts looking down the list of dependencies and starts with the first one, which happens to be boil water. And he says, oh, now I need to boil water. Oh, but what? Boil water has some dependencies. I need to look at each of its dependencies and make sure they are satisfied first. And the first one is buy pasta. He says, oh, look. Can't you see a pattern here? Mm -hmm. We must go to the store first as a prerequisite. So let's focus on that task. And it says, OK, go to the store has no prerequisites. I can actually do the go to the store work right now because there are no dependencies that need satisfying. So we click, check that one off our list. We have gone to the store. We, do, we execute the body associated with the go to the store task. And we go back, and we're back now at buy pasta. All its dependencies have been satisfied. So we can click that one off our list. We go back up the chain and say, okay, boil water. It has two dependencies, one of which has been done. The other one still needs to be executed. So it will go and focus on buy cheese. It sees buy cheese has a dependency go to store. But look, we've already done the go to store task doesn't need to be done again. Rake is smart enough that once you do a task, it won't try to do it again. So you won't get that repeat. It's not like these things are methods and you have call and you're calling out to other methods. If these were methods, you would go to the store twice. But in Rake, because they're just listed as dependencies that must be satisfied, Rake knows it's already satisfied and won't run it again. So we can click off by cheese. Now the boiling water is done. Both of his dependencies are satisfied. And now we're back up at make mac and cheese. It has three dependencies, but oh look, the buy cheese and buy pasta ones have already been done, so there's no need to do them again. And now we can click off 
make mac and cheese. So the body for that one is run. So rake is simply, turns out that the, the engine that drives rake is about 100 lines of code, probably less than that, maybe about 50 lines of code. It just walks the tree of dependencies, executes the prerequisites, and then walks back up in, in a kind of a depth first manner. It's actually pretty simple coding. Questions so far? Okay, that's it, we're done. <laughs> actually, this is the basics. This is the essence of rate, getting those dependencies right and declaring them right. And uh, so, it, so what more is in rate? A <laughs> um, couple things. It's really convenient just to say rate at the very top level, just say rate, and have it some, do something by default. So rate recognizes a task named default, and if you give it dependencies, it will try to satisfy them if you uh, do nothing else. So if you say rate with no task on the command line, it will go to the default task and satisfy its dependencies. So this is a nice way of specifying what to do by default. Did I see a hand back here? Were you, did you want to ask a question? I was just wondering, what if you put circularity in that dependency? Rate will detect circularities. So it will say, oh, ooh, this is a circular dependency, and it will complain and groan at you until you fix it. And I think it does so, I'm trying to remember now, it's, it's, it doesn't actually happen that often in real life, but you can occasionally get, and it, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember if it complains right away or if it actually tries to execute part of the tree before it gets done with it. But yeah, it will, it will detect that. Okay. So Rake is a task execution engine. So let's talk about the environment in which it runs. Um, you probably have a project directory that might look something like this. At the top level of your project, you're going to have a Rake file. And this is required. This is where you put all your tasks. And Rake will recognize that Rake file and use that. However, you don't have to put everything in there. If you want to break up your Rake file into component pieces, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, you create a directory called Rake Live and put individual files in there with an extension .rake. And Rake will automatically go into that directory and pull in those files as if they were part of the main Rake file. In addition, if you are running a Rails project, Rails tells Rake to look for additional tasks in the live slash tasks directory. And you can put .rake files in there as well. So in a Rails project, you can put things in here as well. So, but this is, only, this is something special that Rails does. Rake by itself <laughs> will do the first two, and Rails does the second. So you can split up your files and put them wherever you want to. And that makes it really nice to create a bunch of kind of modular things. Um, for example, that tags file there is a, a rake task that will go through and find all my Ruby files in my project directory and will run them through the etags program and create an index that my editor uses to jump directly to class names and, and method names kind of very quickly to navigate the source code. So it's kind of nice to be able to generate that. I do that on almost all my projects. So I just drop a tags.rake file in either the rake live or in the live tasks directory and pick that up automatically. So that's really nice to be able to break that up. Um, okay. Ah, here's something you should be aware of. Um, once you start breaking up things into separate files, it's quite possible, especially if you have .rake files that come from different sources, it's quite possible you have task names that conflict with each other. So Rake allows you to put your tasks within a namespace. Now we didn't do it in that example, that uh, the mac and cheese example, but however, um, to me, going to the Apple Store is very important, and I feel it should be a part of my Rake file. <laughs> and so I create a namespace called Apple, and it's just the namespace command here, the colon Apple with the do block, and everything within that do end block is within the namespace Apple. So I can have a task called go to store, within this namespace that is entirely separate from the task go to store outside of the namespace. If you make modular dot rate files that you want to drop into a lot of different projects and not have them conflict, I recommend putting all your tasks within a namespace so they don't conflict with other drop-in rate files that you might have. Um, to invoke something in namespace, 
you just say rake apple colon task name, namespace colon task name. You can have nested namespaces as deep as you want to go, that doesn't matter. And so I can still get to the original go-to store, or I can get to the Apple go-to store tasks separately. And they remain independent, and they don't interfere with one another. Um, my great fear was people would start creating these modular rate tasks, and they'd start combining them, and we'd have accidental dependencies between this task and that task. And this, this is the solution to that problem. So let's talk more about environment. Rake is a command line thing. How many people here work a lot with command line? Awesome. How many people here use an IDE like uh, RubyMine? Okay. RubyMine has a rake execution thing in it, right? Yeah. So you can do it either way. Um, if you are on the command line, you have the possibility that you can change the directory you're in. And uh, for example, if you're in a, a Rails-like project, you might have an app directory with models in it. And you might CD, change directory down into your models file. And you're here. What happens when you type rake db migrate in there? Because the rake file isn't in that directory. Now, if, you're, if you've ever used make, or even ant, I believe, is the same issue, yeah, that if the ant file or the make file is not in the directory where you issue the command, it gets all confused. Rake is just a wee bit smarter than that. Um, if you say, for example, rake db migrate here, while you're currently, or while your terminal is in the models file, Rake is smart enough says, oh, there is no Rake file here. He'll go up to the app directory and say, oh, there's no Rake file in here. He'll go up to the project directory and says, oh, here's my Rake file. This is where I need to be. So he'll find the Rake file, and then he will say, this is the directory from which I run commands. So no matter where you are, you can be nested, you can CD deep down into your project directory. If you run Rake, Rake will run as if it was started from the top directory there. That means whenever you reference a file, you only need to give the relative path from the project directory. Because Rake always runs from the project directory. So that, that makes file manipulation just a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about where you issue the command and if it changes as you navigate your tree. I really like that feature. Okay, here we're demonstrating the fact that uh, Rake knows where you're at and goes to the project directory. So if we create a task here called show current directory, and in there we have a little Ruby code that puts out the um, PWD is the print working directory command in Unix. So this will print out your working directory. And if we CD down into models and do the print working directory here, we see it knows that we're in the models directory. However, when you run Rake, show current directory, it runs PWD, and PWD knows it's in the main mac and cheese uh, project directory. So just demonstrating that it in fact works like a claim it does. Okay, let's talk about the command line in Rake. Lots of options on, on Rake. I'm gonna talk about just a few of them. One that people don't know a lot about is the dash P command. Rake dash P will give you a list of all your tasks in defined in your rake files and your dot rake files. And it will tell you what they depend upon. So here we can read this. It says boil water depends upon by pasta and by cheese. Uh, by cheese depends upon go store, go to store. By pasta depends upon go to store. Go to store uh, doesn't depend on anything. And so you're giving a list of what the main tasks are and what they depend upon. So it gives you, you could use this to kind of actually construct a little graph of all the tasks in there. So that's, that's a really handy command. If you want to know absolutely everything that's in defining your rate file, this command gives you everything. Now another really nice command is the dash t, but dash t is a little different. It only tells you about documented tasks. So if you want to comment your tasks, but well you could put up it's Ruby, right? So you can put a hash character, an octothorpe character, and put a comment in your rake file. And that's fine if you're reading the rake file. But rake itself can't see those comments. And in order for it to report to you what 
uh, a description of a task, you have to put that description in. That's merely the DESC command, describe command. And that goes right before a task, and you, it's, you just give it a string. So the make mac and cheese description is right before the mac and cheese task. Buy some delicious cheese, buy quality pasta, boil the water. And you notice go to store has no, no description at all. I didn't bother to document that one because I kind of felt that was kind of an internal task that people don't need to know about. And so when I run rake-t, it tells me about all the tasks that are documented. So you get the mac and cheese, the buying task, and you get the uh, boil water task there. Uh, I believe they're sorted alphabetically. And you get a little comment uh, telling you exactly what they do. So you can give it as much description as you want right there. Now the output of this command is cleverly designed so you can go and you can like highlight rake by cheese and paste it in your command line without typing anything extra. So that was actually purposely designed to do that. So that's convenient. But notice the go to store is not in there because that's kind of an internal task. And we didn't document it, so it doesn't come out with rake dash t. Um, if, <laughs> if you've ever done this on a Rails project, you know that you've got a bazillion tasks in rake. And you can. You could grep through those if you're looking for a particular one, but you could also just say uh, a string on the dash t option, and it will find those tasks that have that string in them. So if I want to know what all the by tasks are, I can say dash t by, and it'll tell me uh, rake by cheese and rake by pasta. Uh, this is really handy. Uh, a lot of times in Rails, I want to know what all the db commands are. So rake dash t db colon will give me all the db commands, the db migrate, the db rollback, the db um, test prepare commands. Yeah, question in the back. Is it by looking for by in the name or in the description? Uh, by in the name. Does not, look, does not look at the description for the match. Only matches in the name. Oh, yeah, and here's, here's the db command, actually. And this is actually truncated quite short. There's many more commands. Okay. Uh, here's a cool command that's just recently put into Rake. If you've got a recent version of Rake, you can ask it, where in the world is this task defined? And you can say dash w, give it a task name, and it will say, oh, that task is in this file, on, in this, it's on line 19 of our particular uh, Rake file here. So that's really handy. If you want to know where something's defined, it'll do this. Now, unfortunately, this only works with documented tasks. Uh, and the other day I wanted to find where some undocumented task was defined and it wouldn't find it. That's a bug. I think we'll fix that in the next version of Rake. Okay. Environment variables. You can pass information to Rake other than just task names, which is really convenient. In Rails, a lot of times you say like Rails underscore env equals test or something like that. Well, this is how that works. Rails is cognizant of environment variables. So I can set an environment variable like this, and then I can reference it within the rake file as, well, it's just the E and V uh, uh, map that Ruby provides to us normally. So I can just get you environment variables normally like this. So if I set stuff to X, Y, Z, Z, Y, and show it and then print it out, it will show me that stuff is X, Y, Z, Z, Y. Now this is setting and exporting an environment variable to your shell. Uh, this works in Max and Linux. I'm not quite sure what Windows does. Can you do this in Windows? The command lines? Or something similar? You can do that in Windows. Okay, you can. Okay. I'm not a Windows guy, so I don't know. But it's, it's a very handy way of doing this. Now, there's a shortcut to this. It's all shell based. Okay, this is all the sh based on shell. There's nothing to do with break. You can shorten it like this. You can actually say stuff is plot. Rake show stuff, and that will assign stuff, but only for the execution of this command. It kind of goes away after that, so it's not exported anywhere else. So you can pass one-off things into it, and uh, that works as well. However, there's one more way you can do that. If you put it on the Rake command line, Rake is smart enough to say, oh, look, there's something on my command line that has an equal sign in it. That means I want to set the environment variable. Rake will go ahead and set the environment variable internally as if it were set outside the program. So you can pass in a bunch of things like this. Um, Rails E and V is passed in like this in Rails. Uh, the, when you roll back, you can pass in a version number like this on DB rollbacks. 
this is used a lot to pass additional information in. There's also a way to pass in particular arguments to a task. Right? It's kind of outside the uh, boot camp territory, so we'll uh, save that for the advanced class. Excuse me. Yeah. I did get a difference of putting a front or behind. Um, when it's in front like this, the shell is handling it and setting it in the environment, passing it into Ruby. When you're doing it like this, Rake is handling it. But the effect to you as a writer of tasks is the same. It doesn't matter. Okay. And let's see. I, it's, I, it says I have 10 minutes left, and since I started five minutes short, I'm going to rush here a little bit. Yes? Uh, you said it there. Is it persistent outside of that execution of rake? No, it is not. It's only set internally to that um, execution of rake. That I want to ask because I've actually <coughs> seen programs that leave it persistent. Not Rails, but... Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. You, you can. It's hard to do, though, actually, because it's, well, that's Unix stuff, and I, let's not get into that. Okay, cool. So, so far our examples, we had simple put statements as the actions of tasks. Now, if all we could do is puts, that would be kind of silly. That wouldn't be very interesting. So let's talk about the kinds of things that you can do as rake actions, and there's actually quite a bit. First of all, it's Ruby code. You can do anything you want to and the task here, I'm calculating the factorial as the body of the factorial task. And I pass in the number of the factorial that I want to calculate in there as an environment variable. It calculates it. You can do it. So anything you can imagine in Ruby, you can do. Okay, so first of all, so there's no limits to what you can do in a rate task. Okay, keep that in mind. However, there's a couple things that are really convenient to do in a rate task. One of them is file manipulation. And there is a file utils, utility in the standard library, that comes with things like uh, copy, copy recursive, move, um, make directory, all the standard command line file manipulation commands are part of file utils. Rake takes all those and makes them directly available. So you can say make dir copy or copy recursive in there. And here, suppose I wanted to make a backup. Create a directory, copy my rake file into it, copy all my rake live files into it. Uh, the nice thing about doing this is that if you wanted to do, so notice everything gets printed out, everything rake does gets printed out here. If you wanted to do it silently, put it in a verbose block, or set the verbose flag on the copy command or the make their current, all these file utilities follow this pattern, which you can make them be quiet or verbose as you wish. And here, then you get nothing when you do it. If you like, your commands to run silently. Uh, this is everything in file utils. Lots of things. So look up the Ruby documentation for file utils. Everything's there available at the top level in a rate task because it's convenient for you to do. Also, a lot of times you want to run shell commands. Now here I'm running get status. Seems to me silly to type rake get underscore status when you could just type get status. But as an example, okay? You can run shell commands using the sh command that obeys the same verbose flags that all the other file utils follow. So this is kind of built into rake for specifically running stuff in the shell. Also, if you want to run a Ruby command, there is a Ruby command that will run the same Ruby interpreter that is interpreting rake. It will invoke that same interpreter on uh, whatever Ruby program you specify. So it just loads it and runs. Okay, almost out of time. Just a couple ideas. I want to tell you some things I do with Rake. We have this awesome website called Get Immersion that teaches you Get. And it is essentially a bunch of pages of navigation where you go through several labs. I think there's over 50 labs in this. And if you notice, it has things like the Get commands here and the actual output of the Get command right there. Um, we build this dynamically using rake. So what we do, we have a script file that contains all the labs in a single file and says, okay, these are the things you executed. We run rake, uh, there's a rake task to run that and to generate all the output from the commands that are in the script file. So we generate the output dynamically so we know it's character for character correct with whatever version of get we're using at the time. Then there's another rake task that will take the, run the script again and take the examples and build HTML files out of that, link the HTML files together so that the forward and backward files all link. So if we add a new lab in the middle, 
it all weaves it together very nicely. And we have a third rate task that will take the whole thing and publish it as GitHub pages on GitHub. So that's where we put it. So the whole process is automated through Rake, just using a couple tasks that weave all these things together. It's an awesome tool for building all kinds of really interesting stuff like this. You can use it in your Rails thing to take content and maybe uh, uh, build HTML for static pages out of it. You can analyze your source code with it. You can generate all kinds of things. Use Rake, use your imagination on it. And I think I'm out of time. Uh, I'll be out here in the hallway if you want if you have any questions. Thank you very much.